I'm Dan kurtz and this is the Foreign Affairs Interview. I think China believes it can sort of have its cake and eat it too, that it can strain the relations with Russia, it can take a neutral position on Ukraine, and also at the same time maintain, if not strengthen, positive relations with Europe. But I don't think it's working. This week, a Chinese envoy is traveling across Europe and making stops in Ukraine and Russia. Beijing says the purpose of the trip is to discuss a political settlement to the war. But it raises bigger questions, not just about China's attempt to position itself as a peacemaker, but also about the growing closeness of Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. Alexander Gobweff and Bonnie Lin join me to discuss what these developments mean for the war, and also what a long-term convergence of China and Russia will mean for the geopolitical landscape long after the fighting in Ukraine ends. Bonnie, Sasha, great to have you here. Bonnie is a fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She previously served in the Pentagon, including as country director for China. Alexander, who goes by Sasha, is the director of the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center, based in Berlin, where he moved after leaving Moscow at the start of the war. He is one of Russia's greatest experts on China and has watched this relationship as closely as anyone for years. There's a lot of uh, newsy material to cover today, but I want to start by looking backwards a bit at at the relationship and how we've thought about it over time. And Sasha, let me start with you. There were a lot of smart people, if we go back just a few years, who saw reasons why there would be long-term tensions between between Russia and China. They fought a war a few decades ago, not that long ago. Uh, There are lots of um, reasons for suspicion. So tell us a bit about what that conventional view saw, even even as you started to see mistakes of it? I think that people's analysis was rooted really in the big rupture during the Sino-Soviet split. And yes, uh, Soviet Union had uh, tens of thousands of soldiers on this border. The border was fortified. It was prepared to use tactical nuclear weapons in the battlefield. And for China, that was also the major conventional threat to the north, and then sparsely populated Siberia and very dynamic and very populated China seem to be an asymmetry that's unsustainable. And then, oh, China started to import hydrocarbons in 1994, so probably China will overtake Russia's economic presence in Central Asia. With that comes political ambitions, and that's where there will be point of friction. And then in the 90s, the backbone of Chinese military modernization was imports from Russia. Of course, China was put under Western embargo following uh, Tiananmen uh, in 1989. And China really imported a lot of hardware uh, from Russia. And along the way, the Chinese military machine was brazenly helping itself to bits and bytes of Russian military technology. So people correctly identified that there is a lot of kind of grievances and resentment in the Russian system towards China. People are not blind that China is engaged in commercial and industrial espionage uh, at the time when buying all of the systems. And that, I think, produced a lot of basis for the analysis that, yeah, a lot of this is kind of hot air and official pleasantries, but deep down there are these rifts that it will be impossible for Beijing and Moscow to overcome. Bonnie, let let me turn to you. And again, let's go back before the invasion of Ukraine and all that has changed in the last 15 months or so. As you look at Chinese strategy and Chinese foreign policy, how has Russia fit into it? If you look at how Chinese scholars have talked about the importance of Russia and the differences between China and Russia, one thing that's not lost on Chinese experts is how, from the Chinese perspective, Russia has been so aggressive in its use of force. So um, we can we can talk about uh, China's position on the Russia-Georgia war in 2008, which was not exactly supportive. China's awkward position when Russia first invaded Ukraine uh, in 2014. And of course, China was also observing the Syrian civil war, uh, which Russia has uh, taken a part in. So when Chinese scholars writing even before February 2022 looked at the China-Russia relationship, many had 
echoed exactly what Sasha said, the deep d- distrust between the two countries, the lingering historical animosity and that has persisted since the Sino-Soviet split. But generally, I would say among the leading scholars of Russia in China, what uh, President Xi Jinping agreed to with Vladimir Putin was a surprise. Uh, it was not something that uh, China's leading Russian experts had anticipated. And if you read the writing, their writings beforehand, it seemed to go in the direction that they were not advocating. So I would actually say that a good portion of where we see ourselves now in terms of the strong, close partnership between uh, China and Russia, I would actually attribute to the strong ties between the two leaders, between Xi himself and Putin, and the, the sense that they are both leaders ruling large countries facing a similar set of issues and under attack from the West. It's really striking that these are two very personalist systems, right, where you're really seeing policy driven by the ambitions and needs and uh, paranoia and whims and fears of one individual. So tell us about the relationship between Putin and Xi from what we can see. How alike are they or not alike? Do they get along well? What really attracts them to each other outside of that strategic need? First of all, I would agree with Bonnie that this is the glue that sticks them together. And then also skepticism, to put it mildly, towards the U.S. leadership and uh, deep suspicions that the U.S. is out to get them, that it's out for regime change against both Russia and China is really a shared worldview. Putin is not a president. He's a Tsar of Russia, where Xi Jinping is really more like an emperor now. They are age mates. Xi Jinping is just six months younger than Putin. And you would find, if you want to, a lot of similar parts in their lifelines, in their biographies. Both have daughters. Fathers fought in World War II against Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan. Both had hardships in their youth. With Putin, like, growing up in this humble background in Leningrad and Xi Jinping being the send-out youth... And then both uh, climbed the ladder to the supreme position and both really feel that, you know, there is needs to be this pushback against the U.S. hegemonism. So I think that it's no surprise that for the first time you have leaders that are so similar and there seems to be a real chemistry between the two. I have observed two twice only in person. And of course, they don't share a language, but you see by the body language that they like each other. And I think that all of the available footage with the pancakes and stuff is a testament to this. So Sasha, you were, of course, watching closely that February 2022 visit that Putin made to to visit Xi Jinping in China. This is, of course, around the time of the Olympics in China. It's a moment when the American government is screaming about an invasion, but a lot of the world can't quite believe that Putin would do it. And this is, of course, when they stand together and talk about this no limits partnership, which has become infamous since then. How should we understand that statement? What were they trying to convey from it? And what is our best sense of what she knew about Putin's plans for the war? Do you think they discussed it in that moment? I talked to multiple Chinese contacts who sought me out uh, and wanted to talk. And then the embassy in Moscow, and I was still in Moscow, I left Moscow only on March 1st last year. The embassy was in COVID lockdown mode, so people were not really meeting, but you could call a person on WeChat and discuss. And I received multiple calls from Chinese colleagues with them asking like, okay, we are reading this stuff uh, in the New York Times and other media, and there is all of this American hysteria. So tell us, Sasha, how should we read that? Like, is it real? And then you are part of Carnegie, so many of your former colleagues, including your former boss, Bill Burns, is now director of the CIA. What does it mean? And then I said, well, I have reasons to unfortunately believe that what we are reading is true, precisely for the reason that I know these people a little bit. And then there definitely is a team of tremendous integrity. They would not manipulate intelligence. And the way it's disclosed and the language that senior U.S. government official use show that they know something and that's something which I would take very seriously. And then there are all of these reasons why Putin, after his COVID lockdown, might be really contemplating something because he's very much divorced from reality. And then Chinese scholars would walk me through all of the downsides that would 
appear if Russia invades Ukraine. And would say, but it is so crazy. That's just so irrational. And that relates to a point that Bonnie made earlier, that Russian foreign policy seems for Chinese Russia watchers to be too aggressive and sometimes irrational. I think that a lot of Chinese analysts say, well, that's just so emotional, impulsive. Why would anybody do that? My sense is that Chinese leadership didn't fully grasp the seriousness of the event. And then Ed uh, Ed Wong had this report in New York Times that the U.S. government tried to brief the Chinese leadership through the embassy in D.C. And then what did Chinese mission to the U.S. do? They passed this information to the headquarters in Beijing saying like, look, this is how the Americans are trying to frame this in order to drive a wedge between Russia and China. So I think that Xi Jinping came totally unaware to what Vladimir Putin is about to do. Vladimir Putin never told him, and he never told the extended Russian national security team. So there were probably seven to eight people in the room where all of the planning for the fateful invasion was made. So why would he tell a foreign leader in presence of interpreters and other officials? I doubt that. China never evacuated its citizens. So probably if something has been discussed, it was based on what I know more about nothing happening before the Olympics. And then when the Olympics is over, like small scale provocations, maybe, but nothing before the end of the Olympics. That's where China was really focused. And then this is why the language was chosen that was pompous and sounds like grandiose. But Xi Jinping was not back in the day thinking of what kind of impact uh, and impression it will create given what happened later. So you think Xi Jinping would take back that no limits partnership if he could go back and do it again? Well, we see that the Chinese diplomats are trying to walk this back very skillfully, particularly Ambassador Fu Tung in Brussels, who works with the commission, with various European governments, with leading uh, European media, trying to explain that, no, 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 we didn't know, we are not with these guys, and we are actually very much opposed to this war. And uh, Qing Gang, when he still was ambassador in D.C., tried to do the same line. But I think that the damage was done by then. Bonnie, let's go back to the the early, early days of the war. You called the initial Chinese response uh, stilted and confusing, right, that there was a a real struggle by China to figure out how to respond and what to say about it publicly. Walk us through those early months. How did China respond and why was it put in such an awkward position by Putin's decision to invade? I would be surprised if she had no inkling that Russia was going to use force against Ukraine. But maybe like what you suggested, maybe the conversation between Putin and she wasn't as forthright, in which, of course, I don't expect Putin to have been sharing any of the details. But maybe he did provide some inkling to Xi Jinping, hey, we might use force after the Olympics. And exactly as you noted, the Chinese concern at the time was to make sure, unlike the Georgia war, in which Russia used force when China was hosting a major international event, the Olympics. But I would be surprised if she didn't know anything. Um, I do believe that within the Chinese system at that time, there was a general misperception of how that war would occur. To be fair, this is not just Chinese experts saying this. I think there were lots of experts in the United States, in Europe, also predicting that the Ukraine conflict would be short. Russia would come out quite victorious. And part of this was a misreading of what exactly Russia was doing and how prepared or how organized the Russian military was. So from the Chinese perspective, looking at the war, we had very early on many Chinese experts on the record publicly saying that the war will be short, that the implications for China would be next to none because it would be over. And we even had some very famous Chinese scholars saying the impact would only be on Europe. So early on, the major issue that China was balancing was how does it position itself now that it has just uh, just, uh, released a joint statement with Russia talking about the no limits partnership and Russia engaged in an invasion of a sovereign country. Ukraine is not from from China's perspective. It's not part of Russia. So your your best guess is that Xi Jinping wouldn't have been surprised that Putin did it, but that he did it so so ineptly. I I think Xi Jinping may not have had full knowledge of the extent of Russia's full campaign, but I think he probably had some inkling of something happening. And he probably also did not expect that the Russian uh, military offensive was so poorly executed. So, Bonnie, if we if we look at those first months, you can see Chinese officials and experts struggling with 
their response to a war that has gone differently than almost everyone expected before the invasion started. But then you start to see a shift in the Chinese reaction, and they go from uh, being stilted and confusing, as you put it, in their response to being much more adept and proactive and trying to make the best of a situation that had uh, taken them by surprise. What are the elements of that strategy? How, how do you see them kind of going on, on the offensive, as you put it in a piece with Jude Blanchett in August of last year? I think the first thing was China tried to position itself. And I say tried. I, th I think most external observers would say China's attempt to portray itself as neutral are far, is far from successful. So as Sasha was suggesting, China tried to walk back a little bit of the no limits partnership, particularly the term no limits, which to many observers seemed to suggest that China was fully supportive of Russia's efforts in Ukraine. So China tried to position itself as in the middle. At the same time, we saw China very much supporting most of the rhetoric and messaging coming from Russia, saying that this is a war in which Russia has legitimate security interests, in which NATO and the United States are some of the major causes of the war and supporting the war. At the same time, we saw China recognizing that as it was positioning itself trying to position itself in a neutral position. It also needed to do a lot more because some of those messages weren't really making too much inroads. So China was, became very active in reaching out to the global south to make sure that the global south would be able to pressure the United States and NATO to try to end the war in a shorter time frame. Because China saw how much the impact of the Ukraine conflict wasn't just localized in Europe, right? It was impacting global supply chains. It was very much disrupting also the production of food, also disrupting energy supplies. So from China's perspective, they were making the case, and this was very much actually in line with China's position prior to the Ukraine conflict, that the United States and NATO shouldn't be engaging in unilateral sanctions. Since the war started, Beijing seems to have become a really important source of support to Putin in a variety of ways. How have we seen a deepening in both the security and economic dimensions of that relationship? Well, since the global credit crunch of 2008-2009, Russia was expanding this commercial ties to China, really waking up to the growth of the Chinese economy. Like it was, it took really the global credit crunch and the knockdown in which the Russian economy found itself back in 2008-2009 to wake up and say like, oh, we have a giant prosperous neighbor that really requires all of this hydrocarbons that we have, and we don't have a bloody pipeline, so we should build that very fast. So the idea that I discussed back then with uh, people in Moscow in the government positions was like, 40% of our trade will be with the European Union, 40% will be with Asia, mostly with China, and 20 with the rest of the world. And then what happened with the introduction of sanctions is that this 40% with Europe, and that was trade volume, was gradually diminished because of the wave of sanctions and counter sanctions that Russia and the European Union and the United States imposed on each other as the conflict was progressing and we reached a stage of sanctions overdrive. So Russia had to try to reorient its economy towards China, but there are very obvious bottlenecks and barriers, particularly the infrastructure. So I think that it will take some time for Russia to do that. And we see that Russia is addressing it. For example, Prime Minister Mishustin is going to uh, China by the end of this month, and uh, they will uh, sign an agreement to build a pipeline from Sakhalin Island, bring in 10 billion cubic meters of natural gas to China. They will talk about a new pipeline uh, bringing gas from Yamal that used to go to European Union to China. So this will be the agenda, but it, it's very hard to make. I think that asymmetry in this relationship was really inbuilt very early on because China is a much bigger, much more technologically advanced and much more rapidly growing economy where Russia is stagnant. Now it's an asymmetry on steroids where China has just so much more leverage and Russia doesn't have that many options. Bonnie, what about military assistance? There have been these 
continual suspicions about uh, Chinese consideration of providing lethal aid to to Moscow to, that would really benefit its struggling war effort in Ukraine. What has been the debate around that kind of aid in in Beijing? And what do you expect? Do you think there'll be a moment when that will become much more on the surface and there'll be much more aid than there's been so far? So, so far, we've already seen reporting of Chinese assault rifles and body armor being delivered to Ukraine. We've also seen reporting of China increasing, I think, doubling the semiconductor chips to Russia in 2022 versus 2021. More Chinese super heavy civilian trucks, which could be used to you know, move equipment, uh, could be used for military purpose. And of course, drone shipments. I saw an interesting report by the Atlantic Council in which they tracked 70 different Chinese companies providing either drone equipment or parts of 26 different types. So I think China is somewhat turning a blind eye. And more recently, I think earlier this year, around the February timeframe, we saw um, leaked U.S. intelligence saying that Russia had requested more uh, different types of support. And there was consideration on the Chinese end of providing ammunition, which would clearly fall into the lethal aid camp. And to my understanding, uh, given that leaked inf- report and the sharing of that information, that caused United States and Europe to put to increase our pressure on China. So I wouldn't be surprised if that incident caused China to be more, a little bit more careful. But fundamentally, the way I see the discussion, uh, or at least the considerations from Beijing's perspective, is that I don't think it's in Beijing's interest to see Russia fail horribly or fall in the Ukraine conflict. But on the other end, China doesn't want to be seen overtly as supporting Russia. So if China could provide covertly provide weapons to Russia or even through a third party intermediary and not be traced back to Beijing, I think that is a relatively attractive option. I agree with Bonnie. And I think that uh, China is also agnostic to the fact where the contact line is. I think that really the bottom line is that China has... Vladimir Putin or somebody like Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin, that Russia remains isolated, but the government structure is the same. And the question mark for Beijing decision makers is like, really, do we need to be overtly involved to help Russia to sustain Bakhmut? Probably not. But Russia is not losing the war to the way that it will challenge Putin's grip on power. I think that the recent piece by Mike Kaufman and Rob Lee in Foreign Affairs is really very clear eyed and instructive that, yes, the Ukrainian counteroffensive might be very successful, but don't expect miracles, don't expect outright victory in Zelensky definition. Absent that, I think China is doing a lot, purchasing Russian oil, delivering chips, and keeping the economy alone. Sasha, I think we're largely on the same page. I do think, though, that she, if possible, would prefer Putin to stay in power. And we saw this when she went to Russia. And I found it curious that he weighed in on uh, Putin's re-election prospects, right? Re-election, whatever, you, whatever that means in Russia. But I found it quite uncharacteristic. And it, it seemed to me at least sending a signal that it wasn't just about the two countries' relationship, but he was also there personally to support Putin. But that doesn't mean that, you know, if Putin had to go, China would necessarily not be want a good relationship with whoever becomes the next Russian leader. But I think what she was trying to convey is our first choice is you stay in power and we maintain the strong relationship. Bonnie, you've talked about this balancing act that that Beijing is trying to strike between these kind of contending interests when it comes to the war and the the challenges that it creates for some of that long term strategic planning. The most recent attempt to square the circle is the peace plan that Beijing put out in very, very, very vague terms, but it has made a lot of noise about wanting to be a kind of mediator here and, and doing something to end the war, even as U.S. and NATO, you know, continue to to, to fuel war and it's telling. What do you think it's trying to do with this peace plan? There's a Chinese envoy traveling around Europe and Ukraine and Russia right now trying to um, at least show that it's trying to play an active role in it. But what what do you what do you see as behind this? I guess I wouldn't characterize the February 2023 Chinese proposal for a political settlement as a plan yet. I would say that what China has laid out is 12 different principles. And the principles, to my understanding, are based on the hierarchy of order. So the first one, sovereignty, is the most important for China. But since then, we have seen China call President Zelensky and since then designate a special representative to go to the various countries, including this week right now, Ambassador Li Hui, 
is currently in Europe this week to talk to Ukraine, Germany, France, and then Poland, going to all these countries. But I think what's interesting is he's going to Russia last. And also what's interesting about Ambassador Li Hui is that he was China's longest serving ambassador to Russia for 10 years. And he was also awarded uh, a prestigious award from Putin himself for improving Sino-Russia relations. Obviously, he's also fluent in Russian. So I do wonder to what extent he might his ingoing positions might be a little bit more pro-Russia than pro-Ukraine. But let me take one step back and say, I'm not confident that China actually wants to play that much of a mediation role. I think what China wants to do is offer you know, to talk to all parties, to bring them to the table and lead the responsibility for actually resolving the harder issues of how to end the war to to the different negotiating parties. I don't think China wants to own the conflict. China doesn't want to be blamed for or responsible for resolving the conflict. But China does want to portray that it's helpful, that it is a global leader, and China wants to deflect criticism that seems to be increasing in the United States and elsewhere that China is interested in prolonging the conflict in Ukraine. Sasha, what is your read on this uh, ostensible peace push and what do you expect to come from it? I agree with Bonnie because when China rolled out this 12th principle document, I think that the audience was in the West to just sh- say that China is not with Russia and we are doing something for the peace and here is a piece of paper for that, but also in the global South and in countries like Brazil, South Africa, there is this big demand like, okay, There is a proxy war between Russia and the United States. That's how many of these countries perceive it. And we have downside effects, food inflation, high oil prices, like where is end to this? And there comes China and says, well, here is the peace plan. And then the initial reaction of Putin and Zelensky was very notable because the Russian side said, oh, Uh, It's interesting. We are ready to talk. So we might have our own opinion, but this is a good base for kind of conversation. Initial comment from Zelensky was very positive. But then that night, President Biden said that, oh, Chinese plan benefits only Russia. So it shouldn't be taken as basis for anything. And that also is a great outcome for China because they can say, oh, we not only produced a draft framework for how to think about these issues, we nearly brought Vladimir Putin and Zelensky to the negotiation group because they were open. And then the opportunity was killed by the U.S. And that peace plan also provided China with a terrific opportunity to go to Russia on a state visit, but not to a leader of a country that leads a brutal invasion and was just engaged in an act of annexation, but also like he doesn't only go to discuss all of these military deals that are on the water part of the iceberg, but above the water, he goes to bring peace. He goes to discuss this peace plan. So that's a terrific conduit. The understanding is that right now the positions are miles apart and on all of the problematic issues about territory and reconstruction, reparations, accountability for war criminals, where Ukraine wants to see Vladimir Putin persecuted, like there will be no agreement on this. So if window of opportunity for diplomacy opens, it will be only about ceasefire. And that's where actually China might play a role, because if there is a push from the West on Kiev to sit down and agree to a ceasefire right now, there needs to be some push coming on Moscow to bring them to the negotiation table and then also respect the terms of ceasefire. And if China can play that role, because if there is a ceasefire, I think China's interests are addressed. Russia remains sanctioned. Nothing is resolved. It remains in China's pocket. But then also China can say to the Europeans, we played a very constructive role. We should get rewards, or at least you should consider how close you get to the U.S. in this anti-China agenda. We'll be back after a short break. You're listening to the Foreign Affairs Interview, brought to you by Foreign Affairs Magazine. Looking for a quick way to understand how global events are shaping our world? Foreign Affairs newsletters provide editors' picks from the week's coverage, as well as timely reads from the magazine's archives. To receive curated foreign affairs content delivered straight to your inbox, sign up for free at foreignaffairs.com newsletter. That's foreignaffairs.com newsletter. <laughs> 
Before getting to the the long-term implications of the Sino-Russian relationship, I want to take a bit of a detour to Taiwan. Bonnie, you've watched dynamics in the Taiwan Strait as closely as anyone, both in uh, official roles of the Pentagon and in your scholarly capacity. What is China taking from Russia's experience in, in Ukraine? You know, watching Putin's military fail at its strategic objectives must be sobering for Xi, but at the same time, the U.S. and Europeans are distracted by the war in Ukraine. So what what military lessons do you think he's taking from the war? And does Ukraine, to put it in very blunt terms, make a invasion of Taiwan more or less likely? Some of the key lessons learned that we're seeing that China take away from the Ukraine conflict is a better understanding of how complex it is to uh, invade another country, as well as the understanding of how much, if the conditions are right, Western countries could actually unite together and provide not only military aid, but also significant economic sanctions. But I do think we shouldn't be overly optimistic that uh, China will take all the right lessons learned from Ukraine. Right. I think as we as Sasha and I were talking about, China's looking at how Russia engaged in the invasion of Ukraine and and they're noting that this is not how Russian textbooks say that it would actually invade another country. Right. That is not how China would invade Taiwan. I think they are learning that uh, Beijing is learning that it needs to further improve the PLA's capability. So we should expect if China were to invade Taiwan, I'm not saying China is going to do that anytime soon or the possibility of that is increasing, that if China were to do so, we would probably see something much more dangerous, much more lethal, and with significant more force than what Russia brought to Ukraine. Sasha, you have put the upshot of all these changes in the the relationship between Moscow and Beijing in very clear and stark terms. You've called Russia China's new vassal. That's, That's what you see as the outcome of all of these changes. Describe what that relationship looks like especially what it looks like from each capital. What does China gain from having this vassal in in Moscow? And what does that look like if you're Vladimir Putin? That's certainly not a comfortable position to be in if you're you're a Russian nationalist. Well, let's start with China. I think that besides the very pragmatic short-term benefits, like, okay, we still have a friendly regime to the north, we get access to cheap raw materials, and we get access to Russian military technology that we might need and Russia was not ready to provide before that. The long-term trend that colors Chinese vision is that, hey, this conflict with the U.S. is there for quite a long time. We need partners. We don't have the same alliance structure for sure. We are a very lonely superpower. But here, if we have somebody who is as obsessed about the U.S. and as angry and can bring capabilities to the, and assets to the table, that's definitely a partnership worth pursuing. That's the view that colors Beijing. I think that that's driving a much more forceful support for Russia that we would expect otherwise, of course, with all of the hedging. On the Russian side, Mr. Putin is in this existential battle against the West that he didn't expect. He thought that oh, after watching Americans withdrawing from Afghanistan and Biden really trying to focus on priority issues, well, Ukraine is not a priority for the U.S. So once I'm successful, they will introduce some sanctions, but they probably will live with that. Now it's a very different ball game. first and foremost because of heroic Ukrainian resistance and then because of the massive support that the West is continuing to provide to Ukraine. So this is existential for him personally, for his regime, and by extension, he believes to his country. And anybody who can bring money and cash flow to the war chest is essential, and China is definitely the major player. But there is also an important third element in this. Russia is seeking for ways to avenge the West for support of Ukraine. Russia tried cyber, Russia tried energy blackmail, and nothing really works. So I hear increasing number of voices coming from Moscow, particularly not voices in the public, that say, well, if we help China to become this superpower that brings the U.S. down, that ends the unipolar moment once and forever, that kills the U.S. hegemony, that's good for us. Enemy of our enemy is our friend. And I think that this understanding that China also knows how to massage the Russian ego. 
and how to present Russia as an equal partner. Like Xi Jinping was not forced to go to Moscow on his maiden trip uh, after the so-called re-election. He could chosen another country, but he went to Moscow and not only did he went to Moscow, did he go to Moscow, but he went on a state visit, like with all of this protocol. So I think that on this, China is really brilliant to make Russia sure that no, it's treated as a respected uh, partner. And that's what's very important for the Russians. Bonnie, you've been much more focused on some of the long-term risks to China of this convergence. Do you think this is ultimately being strategically unwise from Beijing's perspective? I think China believes it can sort of have its cake and, and, and eat it too, that it can ha- it can strain the relations with Russia, uh, it can take a neutral position on Ukraine, and also at the same time maintain, if not strengthen, positive relations with Europe. But I don't think it's working. I do think, though, the longer the conflict in Ukraine lasts, the more tensions it will put on China to try to balance all these different costs. So that's why I do think even though we won't see China pushing too aggressively to end the conflict as soon as possible and using any means to try to force Russia to the table. I don't think China is willing to punish Russia or use any coercive measures to get Russia to the table. So right now, I actually think China is a slightly better position, diplomatically speaking, than, say, six months ago. But again, I think that's because China is becoming more active now. But over time, we don't see much progress the hopes that folks have, that some folks in Europe have, that China can play more of a mediator role will probably be dashed and China will lose that leverage. Let me close by getting both of you to offer some thoughts on the policy options for the United States. Is there anything looking ahead that the U.S. can do to try to reverse some of this or at least deal with the fallout in ways that would uh, make it strategically less costly from a U.S. perspective? Bonnie, let me start with you. I think one of the areas in which we are probably, the United States is probably losing more ground than others is in the global south. I think the United States needs to do a much better effort in countering the various messaging that China is doing in the global south. We're pointing out how problematic Chinese activities are, but I don't see us providing a clear narrative that's getting more countries in the global south to be willing to support Ukraine. Sasha, any policy options you see, again, looking beyond just the war? I feel it's totally inappropriate for me to offer any policy options to the U.S., not only as a Russian passport holder, but as a diehard Russian patriot who thinks that this war is deeply immoral. That's the cruelest war that Russia, the Soviet Union, or the Russian Empire has ever had, because it's against our closest neighbor and against our very close country where, like, my mother was born in Kiev. I have relatives. I have friends there and it's like heartbreaking to see that so it's deeply and patriotic what putin has done and what people have supported and like i as a russian intellectual also bear responsibility for that that it happened but i think that where we can play a role is really in analysis and i think that to understand that around the corner nine months one year from now this issue will not go away Russia deeply aligned with China, providing many resources, still sustainable dictatorship that will bring a lot to the table for this competition is a very powerful factor that every U.S. policymaker should think of. That is a great note to end on. Sasha, Bonnie, thanks to both of you for joining us and for the really wonderful string of pieces you've both done on these issues over the last year or several years. There's so much there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. You can find the articles that we discussed on today's show at foreignaffairs.com. The Foreign Affairs interview is produced by Kate Brannon, Julia Fleming Dresser, and Molly McEnany. Special thanks also to Grace Finlayson, Caitlin Joseph, Nora Revenaugh, Asher Ross, Gabrielle Sierra, and Marcus Zacharia. Our theme music was written and performed by Robin Hilton. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please take a minute to rate and review it. We release a new show every other Thursday. Thanks again for tuning in. 